For our first episode of season two, I'm joined by Lorna Ritchie, Director of Public Affairs at the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market, ICBCM. Lorna was kind enough to meet me in Florence ahead of the IETA European Climate Summit to discuss the important work of the ICBCM and why integrity matters for our market. Since we recorded this episode on April 16th, the ICBCM approved two additional programs, VERA and our trees. These programs join ACR, CAR and Gold Standard as CCP eligible programs under the ICBCM. Together, these five programs have a 98% share of the voluntary carbon market. As Lorna outlines in our interview, the approval of these programs is the first step in a two-step process. The next step towards enabling CCP eligible programs to issue CCP labeled credits is the assessment of the methodologies that they operate. The ICVCM is hard at work in evaluating these methodologies and expects to have CCP eligible units to be flagged later this year. I hope that you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Welcome to the Carbon Exposure Project. Lorna, it's a pleasure to uh, have you here in Florence. Uh, welcome to the Carbon Exposure Project. You're the guest for the first guest for our season two. So cheers. Cheers. <laughs> so um, I guess a bit of an introduction to you. Um, you work at the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets, which has a very important role in our market to, as the name suggests, define integrity. Can you give us a little bit of background about the organization? the key stakeholders, the standards with whom you work with, mm -hmm. and the broader sort of mission, as well as some of the um, specifics around core carbon principles. Yeah. Um, so I'm the Director of Public Affairs mm -hmm. at the Integrity Council. Um, and like you said, the purpose of the Integrity Council is to set a minimum global threshold for integrity for the carbon market. Yeah. So it originally came out of an initiative launched by Mark Carney, um, who was at the time the UN Special Envoy on Climate Change for the COP26 UK presidency. Um, and the idea being behind it is that we need to leverage private sector finance for climate action. There mm -hmm. is no way of meeting, as um, Stern and Songwei found and launched in their report COP26, trillions need to be mobilised in order to tackle the climate crisis before 2050. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that through public sector finance alone. You need the private sector on board. And the best way of doing that is through carbon markets. But they failed to reach their potential previously. There's not been enough um, either demand or supply of high integrity credits. There's been a variable level of quality in the market. Um, and there's been really no oversight to the market in terms of regulation like mm -hmm. you do have in, in financial markets. So the aim of the Integrity Council is to be that kind of financial regulator for the voluntary carbon market to set this minimum standard as part of a kind of mosaic of um, regulatory standards in the market. Um, and so that was really the, the reason behind the launch of it in the first place at COP26. Um, so the Integrity Council itself sets 10 core carbon principles, which uh, cover everything from the governance to transparency, additionality, permanence, all of those um, issues that are really important for ensuring the integrity of a program or methodology. And it, it, they're based on Corsair, which is internationally recognised, has been internationally agreed mm -hmm. between parties, and then also um, additional requirements which were agreed through various different stakeholders. So we have experts from across the market, academics, government regulators, all have provided input into the standards themselves mm -hmm. and also applying those standards to programmes and methodologies. Lorna, thanks for that. Um, I think one of the key components you touched on is around this, the purpose of the, of the ICVCM. It's talking about integrity and that's a very important word because it, it ultimately underlies establishing or re-establishing trust in this market. On the exchange side, we have this old adage that is um, confidence begets liquidity and more liquidity begets more and more liquidity, right? For markets to scale, integrity is absolutely essential. And so from the mission, now that we 
you've given us that background, it's been explained. How, how do you actually achieve that? Can you give us examples, specific ones on the implementation of the Kulkam principles and how you're measuring standards and programs and the methodologies to, mm -hmm. the, to demonstrate that they adhere to those uh, Kulkam principles? Yeah, I mean, like you said, the um, the purpose is to set a high threshold for integrity mm -hmm. with the aim of scaling the market. And um, in the past, under the Kyoto Protocol, we've there's been issues with integrity of projects. It's been very difficult for buyers to tell what credits are um, worth one credit is worth one ton. It's been quite hard to determine for mm -hmm. um, buyers, but also for programs and projects themselves um, it's been quite hard to understand what standards are expected by the market so the aim of the integrity council is to set this minimum global threshold so there's mm -hmm. a consistent standard across all regions which is really important both on the buyer side to give them confidence so they don't get accused of greenwashing where mm -hmm. there's been huge clamp down recently rightly on greenwashing um, so it's really important that buyers understand which credits are um, high integrity and which aren't. And then from the seller side, it's also really important to understand the direction of travel, what standards they should be aiming for, and for them to have a consistent standard globally, because mm -hmm. otherwise you don't want to have to adjust your standards depending on which market you want to sell to. Sure. So the work that we're doing at the Integrity Council through the, the 10 core carbon principles, we set this standard it's a it's a two tick process. So you have um, we're assessing the programs themselves, mm -hmm. their governance, how transparent they are, and then the um, methodologies. So once a program and its methodologies are approved as CCP eligible, it's then up to the programs themselves to label their CCP eligible credits as such, um, and then hopefully we'll very soon have CCP labeled credits on the market. Um, we've just launched three, uh, we just announced the approval of three programs. So mm -hmm. it's the ACR, CAR and Gold Standard have all been approved. Um, right. Like I said, though, their methodologies are currently being assessed mm -hmm. and um, we'll start announcing approved methodologies from May is the aim. And then all of the methodologies will have been approved by September is the aim. Wow, that's fantastic. And so, you know, firstly, thank you for, for outlining that. It's really important work that you're doing. And, and as you said, quite rightly, it ultimately helps to clarify and demystify that high quality question that's in the market. You're effectively mm -hmm. creating a delineation between those units and those standards and those methodologies as you kind of go up that hierarchy that meet that, that integrity criteria, right, of the standard. So that's fantastic. Can I ask you with regards to, um, you, you, you talked about the, the buy side, right, clients. In your stakeholder engagement process, you've also had a, a number of the buy side uh, participants mm -hmm. coming in. What is your take in terms of an, an expectation of how they will uh, react to having CCP eligible or aligned units in the registries? The so we've had really positive feedback. It's been a really um, involved process for market actors. Mm -hmm. Different stakeholders have been had the opportunity to take part in working groups and input into the standards and right. also the assessment of the programs. Um, it's we've already seen that many programs and project developers have started to change their internal processes to align with the standards in the expectation um, that they will have to meet those standards in future. And um, well, presumably there's also a premium for the CCP eligible units. Exactly. Um, it, that is the expectation where there's mm -hmm. demand. There's obviously going to be an increase in um, price point as well, which mm -hmm. is a huge opportunity for project developers. Yeah. Um, the aim is that we'll gradually ratchet up ambition over time. So the, I, the Integrity Council is very open to mm -hmm. feedback on the process. Yep. The aim is to improve over time. It's, it's never going to be perfect from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so we really welcome feedback from market actors on the process and the, the standards as they develop over time. So, Lauren, thank you for that background. Um, I'd like to not only just dive in on the background on your work and, and that of your colleagues at the ICVCM, but also get to know you. Um, you've had a pretty diverse and interesting background, having spent time within the public and the private sector, uh, working at the UK government. Uh, I'd love to get your, your um, understanding of that background, but also you work in consulting, uh, and I'd like to understand that and your, your work with private sector actors. 
I worked, so I spent 10 years working for the UK government. Mm -hmm. um, I started in uh, negotiations leading the Corsia and the UNFCCC Article 6 negotiations for the UK government. Great. Um, it was a really exciting time in the run-up to Catavice, um setting, trying to get the, the first draft of Article 6 approved at the same time as setting up Corsia. And then I moved to, for COP26, for the UK presidency, I led the adaptation negotiations. And the two really complement each other because mm -hmm. working on the adaptation negotiations, you can really see firsthand what it is you're trying to achieve because ultimately what you're trying to do is channel private sector finance towards mitigation in developing countries, support development, support ecosystems. And you can see the real impact that carbon markets and projects have on um, those that need most support in developing countries. And then, like you said, the last two years, I've been working at a consultancy. I've been working um, with companies themselves helping them to navigate the regulatory and policy landscape mm. it's really become a in previous iteration of the carbon market it was very much a private sector focused initiative there wasn't much regulatory oversight at all but mm. now we're seeing a situation where regulation and policy really have a strong influence over the direction of travel so mm. helping companies to navigate that understand what it is that they need to be aware of, especially around kind of regulatory additionality and um, understanding what's going to happen in terms of the Paris Agreement. So it's been really interesting to see it from both sides of the coin, both setting Article 6 in theory and then helping companies to understand what that actually means for them and what project developers should be aiming for in the future. Great. And then how do you see that intersecting with now, obviously, with, with your work at the ICVCM? Because if just I can provide some color here. Um, there's this intersection, let's say, between the compliance markets, you know, uh, and the voluntary markets. It used mm -hmm. to be a clear delineation before, but we've seen that interoperability. You mentioned Corsia. That's a perfect example. I live in Singapore and we have a, a, a tax a system where there's the ability to surrender uh, offsets that are Article 6 aligned to, in lieu of paying that tax. Mm -hmm. So there's this interoperability, and I think that... Um, Quite frankly, the, the compliance markets are going to have a purpose or, or a connection with the voluntary markets. Yeah, it's now a completely different landscape compared to the first version of the carbon market. It is really regulatory driven. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you mentioned Singapore. They're looking at aligning their, um, their carbon tax credits with the standards are set under the CCP, mm -hmm. um, which is really exciting because it, it brings that kind of consistency to, that is needed in the market across different regions. And increasingly, um, like the EU has just recently brought out regulation around consumer standards yep. and um, setting these minimum requirements for how companies disclose their emissions reductions, their transition to net zero. Mm -hmm. Contribution and claims, etc. Exactly, yeah. So it's increasingly becoming regulated what mm -hmm. companies can and can't say about carbon markets. And so in my role in the Integrity Council, what I'm aiming to do is, is to work with governments to try and create a kind of consistent standard for what they expect from um, carbon credits and what companies can say about them. Mm -hmm. Because it's really important for driving um, action in developing countries. You need to channel private sector finance towards these projects and so the only way to do that is to set this consistent direction of travel mm -hmm. um, across, especially countries where there's significant demand, like the EU, UK, US, um, mm -hmm. and increasingly Asia as well. Great. Thank you. So, Lorna, that's great background and just really interesting conversation around how important integrity is to help to scale and drive the markets forward. Love your um, personal story as well. Can we go back a little bit um something interesting you said around the assessment uh process and framework of and the role of the icvcm to essentially provide that role of financial regulator in the carbon markets uh assessing the existing standards you mentioned that there were three standards car acr and gold standard that were mm -hmm. just accredited under the icvcm Can you talk a little bit about that assessment process yeah, the um, the Integrity Council has these 10 core carbon principles that mm -hmm. underpin it. And um, 
so the program is assessed against these principles and then the methodologies like i mentioned earlier yeah. um it's particularly for um so it's first come first serve basis so those um programs that applied to start off with are the first ones to be assessed yeah. but then some are more complicated than others yeah. especially larger programs there's a lot more to assess and analyze a lot more paperwork of involved. course and you've got to get it right um yeah. you can't just uh, make a decision very quickly so we have these monthly board meetings mm -hmm. and um programs are are approved at those um each month so we're we're announcing as they're approved as they're by the board up. yeah so real time yeah yeah exactly we're not holding anything back um and then it would be the same with methodologies and it, exactly mm -hmm. the same with programs some are much more complex than others so we've got kind of a two track process for the okay. assessment of methodologies so some that are fairly straightforward like landfill gases um yes. they are being assessed internally by our mm -hmm. expert panel who uh, are made up of a kind of mixture of those with kind of government regulatory experience academics and then we also, in the other track, um, for much more complicated methodologies, we have... Can you give me an example? So, for example, Red Plus okay. um, is, is quite a complex methodology. Um, we will bring in external stakeholders. So okay. it's a mixture of the experts we have on the expert panel, mm -hmm. but then also multi-stakeholder working groups that will provide input on that. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we're really keen to do is get um, Indigenous people and local communities input right. on these methodologies as well. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to have those voices at the table um, and to engage them early. So this is why we've got this kind of two-track process. It, and some methodologies will um, will take longer than others to approve. To approve. But um, we were hoping to get CCP labelled credits on the market very soon. Great. Thank you. That's interesting if i can just add um my understanding of the icvcm is that you have and as you mentioned earlier this um two tick uh, approval process uh, where you review the standard and the methodologies mm -hmm. it's essentially it's similar to but it's 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 improved on let's say the corsia framework which is just requiring an assessment at the what they call the program or the standard level uh, so that's that is that's interesting to me. Um, there's a there's a delineation there because of the the claim of of ultimately the that, that can be substantiated by the buyer of these units. Mm -hmm. uh, in the voluntary context, there's no need for the corresponding adjustment uh, to substantiate the claims. Um, but on the Corsia side, there is uh, because of the nature of 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 that system. C can we talk a little bit about corresponding adjustments though, and how they inter intersect? I guess with the broader tectonic shift that's happening as a result of Article 6 and how uh, those that market, the Article 6 kind of markets that come from that uh, will ultimately impact voluntary carbon markets. We've talked about, you know, a little bit in, in, in the earlier conversation around different systems that have this interoperability. Mm -hmm. But I'd love to get your take now wearing not necessarily just the ICVCM hat, but your um, you know, negotiator hat. And, and, and talk about the evolution of Article 6 and, and, and the kind of implementation component. Mm -hmm. would, you, yeah. would you indulge me? Of course. So, um, like you said, it's a, it's a two-tick process. It's yeah. unlike Corsair, which just assesses at the programme level, mm -hmm. the Integrity Council is also looking at the methodologies themselves, and then it's up to the programmes to decide which, are CC, um, which credits can be CCP labelled. Yeah. And... Um, so this is, is, we call it Corsair Plus. So okay. it's very similar to Corsair, aligns with um, the standards that were agreed under Corsair. And equally, we're looking towards the Paris Agreement mm -hmm. and the discussions that are happening there to um, inform the standards. And we work on the basis of continuous improvement. So if we find that there are new decisions made under Article 6, which mm -hmm. set um, different thresholds or standards, we're um, open to improving the... Um, the core carbon principles and ratcheting up ambition over time. Okay. Um, and like you said, with corresponding adjustments, one of the things uh, that the Integrity Council doesn't require at the moment is a is a corresponding adjustment for credits. There is an option though to have as a as a core carbon principle um, attribute, you can label your credits as having a corresponding adjustment. So, for example, if you're deciding to retire, from, you mentioned um, Singapore's carbon tax, mm -hmm. that does require a corresponding adjustment. 
So if you decide you want to use a CCP label credit for retirement against that, you could easily spot whether um, there's been a corresponding adjustment applied. But it's one of those areas that we're very willing to take feedback from stakeholders and we're looking to improve over time. If there's a move towards corresponding adjustment in the voluntary market, then that's something that we could adopt in future. Okay. And that's great that obviously you're taking on that feedback and, and, and adapting and, and evolving that standard. But can we talk about that specific component? Like for, from a market perspective, mm-hmm. there's an implementation component there as well. It's being demonstrated currently that it's, it's very difficult to, to get those letters of authorization, ultimately um, the export on the sell side country um, to, to allow for that export of that unit let alone the corresponding adjustment on the host on the other side mm-hmm. of that equation. And so that's, to me, a rate limiting step in terms of the potential supply for, for those correspondingly adjusted units. And we, we think we see that in the price action on Corsia futures contracts on ICE, for example, or indicating that there's this constraint uh, as a result of the recent decision ICAO had. Um, but the other piece that, that, that I think is really interesting is what's your take on a voluntary actor selecting correspondingly adjusted units to effectively utilize for a completely different um, balance sheet exercise effectively? Are they constraining the potential of a country that's, um, you know, are they ratcheting up the ambition on the NDC side, which is one side of it, or are they actually taking away supply from other countries that need those correspondingly adjusted units to, to meet their NDCs on the, on, the, on the Paris side? I think at the moment you've got a real challenge with um, supply for correspondingly adjusted credits, mm-hmm. partly because, um, as um, I mean, de- it's mostly primarily developing countries where yes. you have the project developers, and there's a real challenge around um, building capacity and mm-hmm. um, understanding if I do this corresponding adjustment, and so I have to adjust achievement against my NDC. How do I then meet my uh, my NDC? So I think. Um, as the market matures, as there becomes more certainty about demand, mm-hmm. as particularly through Corsair for correspondingly adjusted credits, you'll see um, more and more countries more willing t- to um, to do a corresponding adjustment on their credits. Okay. In the short term, it is, it's a challenge um, because you have to think of it as part of your national strategy. You have to think about it in terms of long term. Is this going to mm. make it more expensive? What price points should I be aiming for? which sorts of projects should I be allowing to be sold? Um, And that can take time for a country to build that kind of um, capacity and knowledge and understanding of the market, which is in its current form very, very new. Mm. Um, And so for for the voluntary market, I mean, if you're not surrendering the credit for achievement against a country's NDC, you are supporting achievement in the the host country, the country that produced the credit, you're supporting their achievement against the NDC. It's a, a financial support that you're providing so to that So the role country. between public and private effectively helping to drive more of that capital to exactly, go to those initial Exactly, yeah. It's, it's about channeling that finance yeah, to great. developing countries to support them to meet their targets. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, I think it's a really underrated um, source of finance that mm-hmm. um, a lot of we only have a very small amount of time to act. I think that's a really important point. I want to just impress that point. It's, uh, it's, it's almost depressing, you know, when we read continuously. Mm-hmm. You, you mentioned adaptation and your work in adaptation. Daily we're hearing more and more um, you know, just news around, effectively just keep pressing that, that point home about the, the finite carbon budget that we have. So we have a very short period of time. How do we take as much action to scale in that short period of time exactly. so I'm the question yeah I mean we need to act before we hit tipping points mm. so and the only way to ch- channel the volume of finance that is needed is through the private sector and through carbon markets okay and so not having a corresponding adjustment does not mean that there is no integrity to the credits it means you're supporting the, the development of projects in developing countries mm-hmm. you're supporting them to meet their their targets and ultimately towards um, net zero. There's evidence to show that the companies that are buying carbon credits Mm -hmm. are the companies also that have these net zero trajectories. So it's not that they're buying credits in replacement of action. Mm -hmm. They are, they have a trajectory, but you can't 
completely decarbonize your company and your supply chains overnight. And we only have a finite amount of time to achieve climate targets. So purchasing credits is a way of channeling finance to um, to developing countries, to mitigation mm -hmm. projects, and to accelerating the decarbonization process, even if um, companies, and I've worked with a lot of companies in my role as consultant, but it's, it can be really challenging, especially for smaller companies to understand their entire supply chain, yeah. where their emissions are coming from, and then um, to decarbonize us. Not to say they shouldn't be doing that, but it just takes time. And as long as they're on that pathway, residual emissions, it makes sense for them to be able to um, buy credits to contribute towards um, emissions reductions elsewhere. Great. Thank you. So, Laura, maybe I could just pick up from something you just said before um, about how difficult it is for private actors that are actively decarbonizing to achieve their decarbonization goals, especially on scope three, without the use of carbon credits. Can I extend it to other environmental attribute certificates and then uh, touch on the recent announcement and then further clarification by the SBTI uh, just uh, last week about um, their change in, in, uh, in philosophy, let's call it, uh, around the inclusion of EACs to help clients meet those scope three emissions? Can I get your comment on that, please? It's, like I mentioned before, really challenging for a lot of companies, particularly small companies that really want to make a difference to um, reduce their scope three emissions. And for those that are able to, that there should be room for them to go above and beyond and purchase carbon credits as well. Yeah. Um, because what we're talking about, like I mentioned before, is just the volumes of finance that is needed. It can only be done through carbon credits. And it is, like you said, really important that they're still working on that trajectory to net zero. Of course. It's one of the criteria under the Integrity Council's core carbon principles that the projects themselves have to be in line with net zero mm -hmm. um, and can't um, lead to the extension of fossil fuels um, in, within countries. Great. I, I would completely concur with that, but obviously I have a biased view being in the market. But I think the way you outline it is absolutely correct, that it provides effectively optionality to clients, uh, mm -hmm. to corporates, right? My clients. Um, to If they want to use carbon credits in order to achieve those, those targets, they can. And if they choose not to and do it internally, then that would be great as well. But effectively, it could be both, right? Like you said, on, on the scope three side, it's really difficult to, to help to um, achieve those, those targets because of just the complexity and um, the decentralized nature of, of, of value chains. It's, it's actually quite mm -hmm. complex. Mm. I, I want to end on a positive note. There's mm. a lot of impactful work that you're working on and, and your colleagues at the ICBCM you talked about, obviously, the recent SBTI announcement, how that is ultimately stimulatory for the broader market, but importantly to channel finance where it can actually deliver on impact and help to achieve the scale. So I'm gonna challenge you. Can, can you help us end on a positive note? Um, what's there to look ahead to? Uh, you mentioned earlier some announcements that there's hopes for having CCP labeled uh, units later this year. Can you give me an example of that and maybe some other points? Yeah, I think I think there's just so much to look forward to in the carbon market space at the moment. There's so much positive action happening. We've got the first approval of the three um, programs. Mm -hmm. We've got announcement around uh, methodologies which are approved and we hope to have all of the ones that have applied done by September. We're seeing more uh, project developers and programs looking to align with our standards even before we start assessing. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is a really good sign that the market is willing to adapt, is willing to ratchet up ambition over time. We're seeing more and more countries who are introducing standards which align with those that are set out in the core carbon principles. Mm -hmm. um, and this means that we're, we are really moving towards global standard for integrity for the carbon market, which should bring back confidence in the market. And I'm really optimistic that this will be the case and support finance to be channeled to developing countries. I want to drink to that. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers.